America waited out World War II's last tense hours. At the White House, President Truman, State Secretary Burns, and Cordell Hull stood by for the momentous surrender message from the Japanese. Radio men, sound and camera crews of worldwide newsreels kept vigil with Washington reporters. Then, after tantalizing hours of rumors and guesses, came the President's historic announcement, August 14, 1945. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. The greatest news story of all time, final unconditional surrender with the whole world waiting to celebrate VJ. In every town and hamlet across the nation, the story was the same. Chicago heard the news and a hurricane of unrestrained hilarity blew through the windy city. This was how San Francisco greeted the news. The city by the Golden Gate engulfed in a tide of joy and relief. Here, America's major port of embarkation to the war in the Pacific, the Japanese surrender brought jubilation unrestrained. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. The victory special rolled down Market Street with everybody celebrating. All were shipmates on that memorable day, and the Navy salute made it official. The victory flash electrified Times Square, keyed to the bursting point as the magic word of complete surrender came through. It was the long-awaited moment, and the lid was off. Unparalleled were the scenes as multitudes surged around Miss Liberty, throwing restraint to the winds. The world's mightiest city marked the end of World War II in one tremendous shout of joy and gladness. Snowshoes were needed to blaze a trail through streets buried in the biggest paper and ticker tape blizzard in history. Into the night, the Great White Way thundered with the exuberance of exploding emotion. Thus did DJ Day go into history. Gregory Boyington, better known as Pappy. He wrote a memorable saga in aerial combat in the South Pacific in World War II. There were few fighter pilots who did not know his name and the daring of Major Pappy Boyington, famous Marine Ace. The stories that came back from skies where air battle raged were to become legends. Pappy had left Pensacola to join Chenault's Flying Tigers. In 1943 came reinstatement in the Marines and a brilliant record of knocking down 25 Japanese planes before the year was out. One kill short of the record held jointly by Marine Corps buddy Joe Foss and Eddie Rickenbacker of World War I fame. Major Pappy Boyington returned with other aircraft from an Allied raid over the Japanese stronghold at Rabaul late in December 43. He had raised his total to just shy of the record and now was anxious to get his 26th plane. He knew his tour of combat duty was drawing rapidly to an end and he lived for one thing, to shoot down that last plane. Number 883 was a Corsair, Boyington's gull-wing job which flew him to fame as a skilled and confident fighter pilot. It helped him to qualify for the nation's highest honor, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Boyington got his 26th plane January 3rd, 1944. 
But minutes later, he was shot down, landing in flames in a channel off Rabaul, where a Japanese submarine rescued him. He spent 20 months in the toughest enemy prison camps. But Pappy was to come back from the dead, finally liberated on August 29, 1945, to return to Oakland, California. They welcomed him like the hero he was and listened to his grim account of the infamous Ofuna prison. A pretty rugged place. They half starved you and slugged you with ball bats in their fists and make you stand at attention while they beat you with a ball bat or hit you in the face with their fists. This went on practically every day we were there. Or they'd make you clean up the decks with a, with a swab while they chased you down the hall while you were bent over pushing a swab with a ball bat. That's mighty uncomfortable. Japan was out of the war. Peace had been restored to the world. And this was the sequence of events beginning August 30th, 1945, when Allied elements went ashore at the Yokosuka Naval Base in Tokyo Bay. Allied fleets had already moved into Japanese home waters and anchored there. The stage was being set for the formal surrender and the beginning of the occupation of Japan. This then was the process of taking over important bases from which the Japanese had initiated futile campaigns in the Pacific. At 12 minutes after 11 a.m. Tokyo time, three hours after the Allies went ashore, the Yokosuka Naval Base was surrendered by its commanders. Earlier in Manila, troops of the 11th Airborne and the 27th Divisions were prepared for flight to Atsugi Airfield outside Tokyo. Their aircraft was clearly marked as to the destination, and it was eager crews which would fly the victory cargoes of men and equipment into the Japanese capital, viewing MacArthur's dramatic arrival for the surrender and occupation of Japan. Later, following the entry of the first occupation troops, the famed 1st Cavalry Division, Liberators of Manila, the American Embassy in Tokyo was to be taken over by General MacArthur with a memorable ceremony. Raised over the embassy was the United States flag, which had flown over the Capitol in Washington, D.C. on December 7, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. It had flown over Rome and Berlin after their captures, and now flew above the last Axis capital to symbolize final victory. U.S. battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay was the setting for the signing of the surrender terms which officially brought the war with Japan to an end. General Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander for the Allies, joined Admirals Nimitz and Halsey and other top commanders aboard the Missouri September 2, 1945. The ceremony took place on a Sunday. Foreign Minister Shigemitsu and other representatives of the Japanese nation on the deck of the battleship, even as the world recalled that other Sunday in 41 and the act of treachery which shattered the calm of the Pacific Ocean and the world. Now at last, defeated Japan and the Allies were to sign the surrender terms. The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese Imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. As Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, I announce it my firm purpose in the tradition of the countries I represent to proceed in the discharge of my responsibilities with justice and tolerance while taking all necessary dispositions to ensure that the terms of surrender are fully, promptly, and faithfully complied with. First to sign the surrender document was Foreign Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu for Japan's Emperor. Articles in the surrender terms included the following. All provisions of the Potsdam Declaration were accepted. All armed forces were surrendered unconditionally. Acknowledgement that authority of the Emperor and the Japanese government was subject to the will of the Allied Supreme Commander General Douglas MacArthur now signing. 
the first pen became a cherished memento for General Wainwright. The second pen went to Britain's General Percival. In order, the nation signed General Su Yung Chang for China. For the United Kingdom, Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser. General MacArthur called on the representative of the Soviet Union, Lieutenant General Kuzuma N. Derevyanko. Also, the representative of Canada, Colonel L. Moore Cosgrove. In all, there were 12 signatures affixed to the surrender document. And then, in 20 minutes, it was over. Nearly four years of bitter conflict had come to this brief ceremony. The war chapter was closed, and a weary world looked hopefully to new horizons of enduring peace. Home to San Francisco, September 10, 1945, came America's hero of Corregidor, General Jonathan Wainwright, the man who lived through 40 months of indignities in a Japanese prison camp without realizing he had become an idol of his countrymen. For a soldier who made that gallant stand in the nation's darkest hour, a conqueror's homecoming. No defeated general ever came home to such a demonstration. Few victors ever held such a place in the hearts of their countrymen. To Washington and new honors, the C-54 brought the general who survived the death march from Bataan. Climax of his homecoming, reunion with his wife after five years of separation. Through the streets of the Capitol, a triumphal procession passed historic shrines. At Washington Monument, before wounded veterans who fought at Corregidor, General Wainwright warned that America must never relax its guard. This is truly such a welcome as a man dreams of, a locked way behind barbed wire and the bayonets of cruel jailers. It is the surest evidence I could have that you still keep before you the words which I know fired you to great effort after our sorrowful defeat. Remember Batan, remember Corregidor. Half a million Washingtonians roared the nation's welcome to the tall, gaunt general. At the White House with President Truman came his greatest surprise. Jonathan Wainwright, made a four-star general only a week before, was presented the Congressional Medal of Honor, highest award of the nation he served. New York City reserved one of its traditional receptions for General Wainwright. Mayor LaGuardia at his side, he rode out a storm of ticker tape. It was a heartwarming hour when old Manhattan, which had seen so many heroes ride along Lower Broadway, made this tribute so very special. At City Hall, newsmen noted that Wainwright was erect and clear-eyed, although still weak from the long months of imprisonment. Mayor LaGuardia climaxed the memorable tribute. General Jonathan M. Wainwright of the United States Army, an honorary citizen of the city of New York. Infamous symbol of Japanese militarism, Hideki Tojo. He took over the premiership in October 41, advocating war with democracy. He ordered the December 7th attack on Pearl Harbor. At war's end, Tojo attempted suicide, not with his samurai swords or harakiri knife. He preferred a US 32 automatic. His suicide attempt, September 11th, 1945, to avoid trial as a war criminal, failed. Tojo was kept alive by transfusion. A Yank sergeant gave his blood so that the Japanese warlord might face justice. At Tokyo's Amori prison, the former premier was the picture of health. Two months later, as he awaited trial, 
the number one war criminal among 40 Japanese leaders held for prosecution on orders from General MacArthur. Fellow officers virtually shunned the man who launched one of history's bloodiest wars. Then in May 46, Tojo was brought to the bar of justice. In Tokyo's former Imperial War Ministry, justices of 11 nations sat in judgment. For the United States, Justice John Higgins of Massachusetts Superior Court. Here, where they once plotted against the peace of the world, Japan's war criminals stood trial. Hideki Tojo was the subject of greatest interest. The newsreel camera was focused on him when a most peculiar incident occurred. One of the accused slapped him on his bald pate. Read by Captain Van Meter, 55 specific charges in the indictment included mass murder for deaths at Shanghai and Pearl Harbor. Tojo and his crew were accused of conspiring to enslave and rule the world. The trial continued, and here in December 1947, Tojo was on the stand. His defense was already running into millions of words. Japan's war criminals learned at least that justice as interpreted by Freedom's Code called for a chance for even the arch criminal to be heard. Finally, this was the hour in November 48, when Japan's criminal militaristic clique, the wartime premier and his partners in crime, were to face sentencing. It had now become the longest trial on record. Tojo waited out the inevitable. The 11 nation court sentenced each of the top wartime leaders separately. 24th on the list was Tojo, guilty of conspiracy, waging aggressive war and atrocities against allied nations. The sentence, death by hanging. was coming home after World War II. Out of Pearl Harbor steamed the mightiest armada in history. It was Aloha to Diamond Head for Admiral William F. Halsey. Final view of the world-renowned landmark that saw American sea power stricken on December 7, 1941, where now rode the fleet that won immortal fame avenging the day of infamy. Into fog-shrouded San Francisco Bay, where thousands lined the hills and piers, sailed 14 warships beneath crowd-jammed Golden Gate Bridge. To the welcomers on the famed Bridge of the Golden Gate, salute from the Admiral on the bridge of a fighting ship. Americans could never forget Bo Halsey's fight from the Marshall Islands to Tokyo Bay that blasted the Japanese fleet out of the Pacific. By October 16, 1945, home were the sailors from the wars. This was the happiest moment of all. To the port of Los Angeles came the battleship Texas, leading four other veteran warships. Every major port was taking a hand in welcome home to the Third Fleet. World War II seemed so far removed now. Through the Panama Canal, the aircraft carrier Enterprise led a fleet of 28, and it was a tight squeeze for the giant flat top, survivor of many an enemy suicide attack and one of the fightinest ships afloat. In the locks alongside the Enterprise, the battleship Washington inched slowly ahead. It was a close fit here, too, with only inches to spare. A veteran pair, the Washington and the Enterprise, come home in glory. Into New York Harbor, with the dawn lighted by Miss Liberty's torch, sailed famous Task Force No. 2, vanguard of 52 warships that would gather for President Truman's Navy Day review. With a Navy blimp hovering overhead, the Big E berthed at a Hudson River pier. Then the word sailors like best, shore leave.
Boston, too, had the welcome mat out for the men of the North Carolina. Gangway for the Navy. America said, well done, sailor, and welcome home. Nuremberg, Germany, once the shrine city of the Nazis, ravaged by the war Hitler launched on the world, ironically the scene of the final chapter of his partners in conquest. American units were on security guard outside the Palace of Justice during history's most momentous trial. No chances were taken on any escape plots. Carefully scrutinized were the passes of the 400 spectators and court attendants. For in the courtroom, the first of the Nuremberg trials was being held before the International Military Tribunal set up by an agreement signed between the US, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Judges and prosecutors of all four countries took part in the trial where the accused were 22 individuals thought to be the most guilty of the surviving Nazi leaders. Facing justice at the proceedings which began in November 1945 and ended September 30th, 1946, were Hermann Goering, Joachim von Ribbentrop, Wilhelm Keitel, and the other partners in war crimes. The tribunal heard Hermann Goering and company blame all on Hitler. But Nazi films projected on the courtroom screen showed how they fawned on him in their days of power. To the prisoners in the dock, the motion pictures brought back scenes of Hitler shortly after the attempt on his life, for which hundreds of Germans were executed. Rudolf Hess, one-time deputy to Hitler, couldn't take it as the hour of judgment was reached. He seemed to be cracking under the strain. Perhaps it was a sympathy act for the benefit of the gallery. Before the reading of the verdicts, Rudolph made a theatrical exit, but he'd soon be back. Now, with their voices heard in four languages simultaneously, interpreters made it possible to listen to the proceedings in English, Russian, French, and German, the justices delivered their judgments. Hess received a sentence of life imprisonment. Ribbentrop and Keitel sentenced to death by hanging. Thus it went. Twelve defendants to die, seven given prison terms, and three acquitted. One of the two Americans on the tribunal was former U.S. Attorney General Francis Biddle, here reading from the judgments. Sentenced to die, Goering was later to beat the hangman by taking his own life. Sharply in contrast with Nazi justice, the defendants received a fair trial for their war crimes. Most of the evidence presented to the tribunal was in the form of documents, but 116 witnesses gave oral evidence. 83 witnesses permitted to be heard for the defense. Diplomat Franz von Papen, who was acquitted, received congratulations. Also acquitted, Jalmar Schacht, Hitler's one-time financial brain, and Hans Fritzsche, radio propagandist. They found mercy a word missing from the vocabulary of the master criminals of Hitler's time. 